Good morning, Jesus Image family. And we wanna welcome our church family online. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning and celebrate our risen King, Jesus. Um, I wanna read from Psalm 24, and it says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. We welcome you, King of glory, this morning, our risen Lord Jesus. We say, come, come in the room. We thank you that you are not dead, but you are alive. We, we praise the risen, living King. Come on, we don't serve a dead God this morning, but we serve a living God, a resurrected King who conquered death, hell, in the grave. By death, you conquered death, Lord. So we say, all hail the King of glory. All hail the King of glory. We bring you praise, Jesus. We bring you love, Jesus. And we give you all our attention. Worthy King, worthy King. Amen.
our risen King. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Oh Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are risen, Lord. Thank you that you are risen. You are alive, Jesus. You are alive. Our King is alive. You are the only King. You are the only one that is risen. Oh, we glorify your What love, what love is this? What love is this? Jesus, we love you. We love you, Lord. Will your church say we love you this morning? Thank you for your precious blood. Thank you for your precious blood. How we love you, how we love you, Jesus. How we love you. We have come to lavish you with our worship today. We have come to lavish you with our worship today. Be loved and adored here, King Jesus. In your precious, in your most holy name we pray. Amen. Wow, the Lord is here. He is here in our midst. What a joy to be in the house of the Lord today. What a joy to be in the house of the Lord today as family, as family. So we wanna welcome you guys to take your seats. Our choir has a special for you and we are gonna worship all day today. <laughs> we are gonna worship our King all day today. So let's welcome our choir as they minister.
Oh. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Risen King. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, how many know after that? You got to know that our Christ is alive. Why don't we thank Court and the choir? Thank you, guys. Oh. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats. Oh, man, that was good. Thank you, Lord. I feel alive after that. If you were sleeping, now you're alive. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, we have a few announcements uh, for you guys today that we just want to make quickly. Um, one of those is being Jesus 24. Are you guys excited about Jesus 24 this year? We have the information on the screen. Um, you know, being able to be there, you know, we've been in California periodically throughout this past year and seeing just the hunger as these people, um, as the people line up in California and on the West Coast, it's, it's tangible. I mean, he is in the air. You can feel it when you come into that state. Um, you know, I, I, I've lived there my whole life. And to see what God is doing there now is truly supernatural. And, and we believe it, it's not just going to be historic, you know, because it's not going to stay within this lifetime. But it's truly eternal what God is going to do um, at Jesus 24 this summer. And so if you guys want to put that graphic up too as well, the amazing men and women of God that are coming in as well. Um, you know, when I see a picture like that, it's, it's just generations, which is beautiful. We have fathers and mothers and just different generations of men and women of God that are going to be able to pour in to us as we go there. And so as Pastor Michael said, listen, if you guys are here, we're a church. We're part of this. That all we're going to do is we're going to have a big church service in California this summer for Jesus 24. And more importantly, Jesus is going to be there. His presence is going to be with us. We're going to see lives change. And so we do have $15 off. Um, if you guys want to put that up, it's through tomorrow night. Uh, you guys, we have a discount code you guys can put in. I believe, yeah, there it is. Uh, through tomorrow uh, midnight, I believe it is. And so listen, now's the time to grab your ticket. Um, it's going to be a beautiful time in the presence of Jesus. And so we want to invite everybody watching, those watching online, if you're on the West Coast or if you're in Taiwan, come join us at Jesus 24 this summer. It's going to be amazing. So you guys ready to give today? Come on. Why don't we welcome Dion as he comes up here? Amen. What a wonderful day to give to the Lord, right? All right, I'm going to read a scripture. Um, I'm going to read out of Psalm 96. I'm going to read verse 4 uh, through 9. It says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Remember him, uh, all the earth. Now this week, as we've gone through Holy Week, as we've remembered what Jesus has done for us, as we have remembered his triumphal entry, as we have remembered his anointing at Bethany and his sacrifice, the giving of his blood, the giving of his back, and then as we come today, we come to Resurrection Sunday, Easter morning, where we remember and celebrate his resurrection. This day means so much to us as Christians. This day declares and reveals so many different things. Uh, this day, Jesus' re resurrection, it confirms the virgin birth, revealing that Jesus was and is the Son of God. It reveals that he did live a sinless and perfect life and that his offering was accepted and so that our sins are forgiven and we are cleansed. It reveals that he is the Messiah, the great and mighty I am, the one who overcame the grave, destroying death, hell, and the grave, and that he's got the keys back to us and that we have been born again and been raised to newness of life. And so how much more this day in remembrance of what he's done should we bring a thanksgiving offering and an offering of worship because of who he is. This day declares that he is the resurrected Christ. And so let's give today the one who overcame for all of us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. 
So Heavenly Father, Lord, we do recognize, we do remember, and we do celebrate that you are the resurrected Christ, the one that overcame the grave, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that we have been cleansed, that we have been set free, that we have been delivered because of your sacrifice and your resurrection. So Lord, I pray that you would receive this offering, that this offering today would be pleasing to you, a sweet-smelling aroma to you, Jesus. We give you this offering, God, because we're thankful and because we love you and because you are worthy of it in Jesus name amen amen so if you uh, need an envelope you can raise your hands the ushers will come around also there's information on the screen you can text to give and if you're watching online there's information on your screen as well and we'll join you back in a minute
Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Lord, are you washing my feet? What I'm doing now, you do not understand, but you will after this. You will never wash my feet. If I do not wash, you have no part with me. Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. He who is bathed only needs to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Jesus said this because he knew who would betray him. Although Jesus knew who would betray him, he chose to love and serve his enemies. I'm not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but this fulfills the scriptures that says, anyone who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you the truth, before, so that when, so when it happens, you'll believe that I'm the Messiah. I tell you the truth, anyone who welcomes me is welcoming, anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and one who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Lord, who is it? It is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. What you do, do quickly. Since Judas was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Also believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. That where I and what I know, you know the way you know. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back. I have told you beforehand so that when it does come to pass, you will believe that I will no longer talk much because the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me but that the world may know I love the Father. And as he gave me commandments, I do. Let us go from here. Then Jesus and his disciples went out to the garden where Jesus often met with them. Jesus was met with a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, carrying lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. The detachment of troops and the officers of the Jews fell to the ground. Then they arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away.
After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to Mary and some of the other disciples, but he did not appear to all of them. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. If I do not see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Peace to you. Reach your finger here into my hands, and reach your hands here into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. My Lord and my God. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Soon after saying these things, Jesus ascended into heaven at the sight of his disciples so they could bear witness to this truth. The disciples were sitting down, waiting for the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. Suddenly, one disciple had a question. Hey guys, I've got a question. Yeah, yeah what is it? Who is this Holy Spirit Jesus told the way for? Hmm. Oh wait, I remember one time Jesus told us, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. What did Jesus mean when he said, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, for, you, for he lives with you and he'll be in you? Wait, I remember when John was baptizing Jesus. After his baptism, when Jesus came out of the water, the heavens were open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling upon him. Yeah, and who remembers that one time when Jesus was eating with us, he gave us the command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit. Yes, I remember asking him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Oh yeah, but he said to us, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, one thing we could be sure of is that we could absolutely trust Jesus. He told us he wouldn't leave us without help, and that help is his precious Holy Spirit. I'm actually really excited to get to know the Holy Spirit. He'll be with us forever. Yeah, me too. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, just as the Lord promised.
Can, can we thank the kids? My word. Un amazing. Amazing. So beautiful. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, come on. All the Lord has done is just... I told, I told Lily, my assistant, I said, Lily, well, look what the Lord has done since those early days at St. Andrews. Can we just stand and give the Lord all the glory? Come on. I'll give you all the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. Come on, lift the, lift the, lift the praise to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Amen. 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 Well, he is risen. Come on, you know what to say. He is risen. Let's stand back up. Come on, say it with boldness and strength. He is risen. One more time. He is risen. Amen. Now give the Lord praise just one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Give you all the glory. All the glory. Amen. Amen. Why don't you love on a few people? 
few means no more than three and more than two. So why don't you just pick three and quickly grab your seats. Good to see all of you. Where have you been for 11 months? <laughs> I'm just not joking. <laughs> the Lord is alive, therefore we are alive. Amen. Uh, very quickly before I get started, I'm going to teach on the resurrection of Jesus. Tonight we're going to be baptizing folks. What a, what a perfect night to baptize people and to be baptized. Wow. And uh, I can't think of a better night to be baptized. And so the, baptism, the baptismal service is one of the holiest services that we get to experience. and Really one of the holiest moments in all of our Christian lives. We have seen devils manifest on the way into the water and people be filled with the Spirit when they get in. And so it is, it is not a dead ritual. It is an encounter with God. So I want to invite all of you to come back tonight. It's going to be a very sacred and special night. Regarding the offering this morning, for some reason this building gets the most horrible cell service. So how many, see, that's what concerns me. All of you are like, uh-huh. Especially when we have a $38 million building to build. I want everyone to have the opportunity to give. So I've made it clear in the most Greek and kind way possible that this, we have to run some ridiculous fiber optic cable to make the cell service better and it's taking a while, which is frustrating. Doesn't everything just take a while when it comes to groups and companies, commissions and boards and cities and counties, they seem to take a while. That's why we're going to gather and pray tonight, by the way. Uh, but not for the fiber optic cable. But, <laughs> but um, it, how many of you tried to give this morning you were unable to because of bad service? Would you lift your hand? Yeah, okay. Well, we do have a Wi-Fi signal in here that is open. So I want to give you now another opportunity. Can we, can, you can just get on the Wi-Fi. That is a massive part of the crowd who was unable to give tonight, so, or this morning. So just go ahead and turn on your Wi-Fi. You should be able to get in without signing on in any way. Is that right, Carla? Okay. And then there's the QR code. And so I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to give via Wi-Fi. You don't ever want to come into the house of the Lord empty-handed. It's a, <laughs> it is, it is uh, the, only, the, the only rightful response when you approach the king, if you look at the Magi, for instance, they bring a gift. They bring offerings to the Lord at his burial to prepare his burial. Mary of Bethany pours out her best upon the Lord's feet to prepare him for burial. In other words, we declare Jesus as king of our lives when we come to him with an offering. How many of you believe Jesus gave enough to us? It's our joy to give. So there's the opportunity to give right there. And um, for those of you who've already given, if, you, if, if, uh, if you're giving currently right now, just continue to do what you're doing. But let's take our Bibles, if you don't mind. To 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. And for those of you who came out for Good Friday, this place was packed for Good Friday. I am so proud of you all. I really am. My friend, uh, I don't want to give his name because it would kind of give his church away. And, uh, or his denomination away. And you'll understand why I'm doing that uh, when I tell you the story. But he said in his world, Good Friday is like 20% of, of the attendance of an Easter service. And, and we had a crowd like this, at least in the sanctuary, for Good Friday. And we don't glory in metrics, we glory in Jesus. We don't glory in the amount of people who attend or campuses planted. We glory in Christ and Him crucified. That's what Paul said. We glory in nothing but the cross. But I do have to say, 
I, I just want to share with you what he said. He's a, an amazing voice uh, to the nation in his stream. He said, the fact that, you're, that the people of Jesus' image turned out like they did for Good Friday is so counterculture for most of American Christianity. He said it's because we've removed the declaration of the cross from so much of our preaching that we have a culture in the church who doesn't value it. He said people in his church, and he pastors thousands of people, he said he's had multiple people come up and say, Pastor, I just cannot attend Good Friday because it's too heavy. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be like downtrodden. And I w this was yesterday we were talking through it and I was like, ah, uh, okay, I wish I could have talked to that guy for you. <laughs> but it says a lot about America, right? We like to win through dominance. We don't like to win through death to self. We like to win through volume and argument. We don't like to win by bleeding on a tree. And I'm so proud of all of you. It tells me that the message of Christ crucified has found its way into your heart. That the message of receiving the body and blood of Jesus in his presence is dear to you. And so can we just thank the Lord that he's birthing something so beautiful here. I'm really so very proud of you. So thank you. 1 Corinthians 15, I've preached this many times, we'll start here. And some people are like, you know, why don't you start in the Gospels regarding the resurrection? Did you know that the book of 1 Corinthians was actually written prior to Mark's Gospel, which is the oldest Gospel? Much of the church begins with the Old Testament, the Psalms, and then moves into the epistles and then into the Gospels. In 1 Corinthians 15, we'll begin in verse 1. The scripture says, and if you have a Bible, go in your Bible. If you're using a device, <laughs> get a Bible. <laughs> Moreover, brethren, and let's pray actually, Holy Spirit, sear your word into the depths of our being. Reveal Jesus to us. Heal our hearts. Save the lost today. Prepare them, Lord. I thank you in advance for hundreds who will be born again and healed by the power of your stripes. And many will be filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name. All over the world watching and here in this room. Say amen. amen. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. So here Paul is saying, I'm going to tell you what I already told you. Good leadership and good teaching tells the people listening what they're about to hear. Then you tell them what they need to hear and then you tell them what you said. Consistency in our messaging is vital if it is going to become a culture in the heart. Paul has, he's making no apology. In fact, he begins verse one with moreover. I'm doing it again with more velocity, with more focus, with, more, uh, with a greater unapologetic focus. I am going to share the gospel with you. Unfortunately, in, for some reason, in environments like ours, the gospel is like only for the altar call. It's, I already heard that. And can you show me the shiny stuff now? Turn me on to the deeper stuff. You know, like 12 winged green angels with peacock feathers off their faces. Like all the wild passions of the heart that really prove to us that in our own hearts Jesus isn't enough. That the wonder of Jesus is not being valued in our hearts. So Paul says here, to a church, by the way, who is filled with spiritual gifts and filled with sin. You have family members having sex with family members. Paul has to deal with this wild environment. And we're, all, we're shocked today that in environments where the Holy Spirit is moving, that there's sin among the people. It's always been the case. 
And Paul's remedy is to turn them toward the gospel. We should tell people to live pure and holy lives. We should, but that doesn't mean that that is the remedy. The statement, live a holy life, is not the ultimate remedy. The gospel is. Jesus is the fuel for a holy life. So Paul, as any good pastoral leader would do, as any true apostle would do, he reminds them of their origin. Today, many of you were invited here. Some of you don't even want to be here. I can tell who wants to be here and who doesn't. Your countenance gives it away. Your face can't lie. And Jesus still loves you. More people are, who don't want to be in church are in church on Easter than any other day. Because good parents are dragging them by the ears into the house of God. I'm grateful for families who are not democracies. <laughs> That's what my mom did here. They dragged me in here, a sick young boy. I've been bedridden for most of a year. Got healed right there where the cross is. Right there in 1989. Born again right here at this altar. I didn't get a vote and I'm glad I didn't. So we don't have a voting system at the Culeano's house. We have parents and children. There are some things we just don't budge on. So I'm glad some of you got dragged on in or maybe you got invited here by your weird charismatic friend who, I don't know, you just want to talk to and every other word is, wow, whoa, so good. Ah, oh, man, whoa, God told me. You're like, God told you that over your coffee? Uh-huh, sure. I get it, I get it. We, we, we're quite um, pixie dusty at times. We need a little more Bible and a less I just feel like, you know what I mean? I get it. And some of you were brought here just to make some of your wild, flag-waving friends happy. But what you need to know, what you need to know is that before you were ever born, God knew you'd, you'd be in this room. I'm kind of glad you're uncomfortable. Because we need to feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I heard recently, Jess said over dinner last night, I was eating lamb, which is always holy. <laughs> and we were sitting around the table with the family. And we began, I think it was around the table, maybe not, maybe in the kitchen. It's all one and the same in an ethnic house. And I was told that churches are making decisions in their marketing for Easter to not mention the Lord Jesus' name, to not mention his suffering, to not mention the blood, to not mention the cross, to not mention his death, burial, and resurrection. So my question is, what in the world are we mentioning? And it's all to draw the person so that they might feel comfortable. I'm gonna actually take a different approach today. I want the Holy Spirit to discomfort you. I want the reality of hell to be felt in your heart while I'm preaching. And it's because God loves you. It's because the Lord loves you. This is a real, for God to take on flesh and be born of a virgin and to die skinned alive, naked on the top of a mountain at the busiest intersection in the region. That's a big deal. He paid a weighty, holy, massive price to pull you out of an eternity that is hellish. That is dark, Jesus says, that where the worm does not die, where the fire does not end. I want you to feel that. I want you to feel the love of God and his desire to rescue you today. That's what I'm after. And as we exalt Jesus here in the scriptures, the Lord will confirm his word. He promised to with signs, wonders, miracles following and the presence of the spirit will descend and already is. When we lift Jesus high by the Spirit, his power comes down. The Holy Spirit always endorses the gospel. Let's continue reading. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. Say the gospel. That word means good news. Good news. And that's kind of an understatement. It's amazing news. It's incredible news. It is indescribable 
news that, by the way, flows beautifully from the mouth of babes. I don't know about you, but my heart was burning while the children were sharing the gospel. The gospel which I preached to you, past tense, which also you received, past tense, and in which you stand, present tense. So the gospel doesn't just get me saved. The gospel is my salvation. I wasn't just raised from the tomb to stand up by the gospel. I was. But the power to stand in the moment depends on my reception of the gospel message. The gospel message is the message of the Bible. There's so much more to the gospel than a mere altar call. The gospel saves me and the gospel is my salvation. And the gospel is a person, not a formula. And we're going to discover that now. Verse 2, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast. People don't like that one. Some camps really don't know what to do with that one. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you. Say, I will hold fast to the gospel. Say it again. I will hold fast to the gospel. Paul says, following, unless you believed in vain. In other words, the reason you're not holding fast today in your Christian life, maybe you were never born again. Can I talk about that for a moment? You say, Pastor, are you questioning my salvation? Yep. I'm not doubting it. But the scripture says, make your election sure. It's healthy for you to look at the biblical evidence of a redeemed life. Not Western evidence of a redeemed life. Not church culture evidence of a redeemed life. You need more to stake your eternity on than how many Christian songs you have in your playlist. You got to show us more than that. You're not going to whip out your iPhone at the throne. You can't bring your Jesus 24 ticket to the throne. You can't bring a Jesus image hoodie or sweatshirt to the throne. What is the fruit of a redeemed life? The life of Jesus within you. Him making your body his temple. Him living through you. So very simply, is the life of Christ flowing through you? Has the power of sin been buried behind you? As we discussed on Good Friday. Has Pharaoh been drowned in the Red Sea behind you? And are you burning with a heart of worship like Moses and Miriam? Is the word of God true food to you? Do you hate the sin in your life enough to war against it, according to Scripture? Are you living for Jesus? Are the Beatitudes the constitution of your heart? Do you love the world and the things of the world? Because the Apostle John writes that if we love the world, the love of God is not in us. There is no version of the Christian life that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It is the most unbiblical version of Christianity. So Paul here says, uh, it, you were saved when I preached unless you believed in vain. And I mean, in other words, did you just repeat the sinner's prayer maybe because uh, you felt like you wanted to? Or did you meet Jesus in the prayer? Did you go down to the altar to make mom and dad happy? Or did you meet Jesus at the altar? And Paul here is speaking about authenticity of the heart as he, as he addresses vanity or a vain way of experiencing the Lord. Verse three, now he defines the gospel. Say, I am committed to the gospel. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, 
And Paul is not just speaking of personal experience, though he's including that. He encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. I love that. I love the fact that prior to his experience with the risen Lord, he is using scripture to kill the ones the Lord loves. And that's the danger of being a so-called theologian without a love for Jesus in your heart. You will take the scriptures and bring division. I'm not sure I've ever seen the body more divided than it is right now. You can't make anyone happy. You can't. If you don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit today, you're deemed a heretic. If you do believe in the gifts of the Spirit today, you're deemed a heretic. If you look people in the eye and say the sisters of Mary are evangelical, Lutheran, nuns, Luther provoked the entire Reformation. They teach people about Jesus. They love Jesus. They have Jesus everywhere you turn. You can look them in the eye and say, they're not Catholic, and then people will say, yes, they are. You literally cannot make everyone happy. You preach on holiness, you're fire and brimstone. You don't preach on holiness, you're seeker sensitive. It's literally impossible. If you want unity in the church, you're deemed as somebody who doesn't value Holy Scripture. If you value Holy Scripture too much, you're deemed a bigot. Ah, don't live for the approval of people. Live for the approval of the Lord Jesus. So Paul here says, I'm going to give you what I received. And prior to Paul's encounter with Jesus, he's taking the text and using it to kill those Jesus loves. Once he meets the Lord... And this is the progression for all of us. Listen carefully now. What does he do? After he's baptized in water, filled with the Holy Spirit, the scales leave his eyes. The first thing he does is he goes to the synagogue to reason with the Jews regarding that Jesus is the Messiah according to the scriptures. So the same scriptures that he used to kill people with who belong to Jesus, the same scriptures he used to deny the way he is now using to prove that Jesus is the promised one from the old covenant, much of which he had memorized. Amazing. Amazing. That means that if you like to sit in a brown leather chair, don't we all, with a beautiful study behind you and the smell of unsmoked, unsmoked tobacco like in your little cool little uh, New England looking study, you know, that every theologian wants to sit there. If you miss Jesus, I don't care how big your library is, you have missed the point of every jot, every tittle, and every passage from Genesis to Revelation. It is all about Jesus. Amen. Verse 3. I'm going to read through it now. I delivered to you, first of all, that's what I also received, both through his experience with the Lord and with the apostles and through his study of scripture, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So where does Paul begin? The death of the Lord Jesus. Where do most sermons end? Occasionally with the death of the Lord Jesus. You can sit through a meeting and never hear his name. And then at the very end, the very end. I mean, some churches are afraid to even use the scriptural reference because they don't want to offend people with the Bible. The cross is an offense. This is not, uh, if you were alive in the first century, this was not an inspirational symbol for you. You ran from this. Some historians say that when Jesus came back to the Holy Land from Egypt after the Holy Family had to run for their lives because of the butchery of the innocents, some historians say that on their way back in, there had been a slaughter, a massacre, and Jesus would have come back in to the Holy Land with Joseph and Mary via roads that were lined with crosses that had hanging criminals on them. Imagine Jesus knowing that one day he would die at 33 and a half years old and here he is as a young boy coming back to his land 
and has to travel on a highway that's lined with crosses. You didn't hang these on your neck back then. There's nothing wrong with it. I have one on. But this was not something that was like part of culture in a positive sense. This meant you were a shameful criminal and the last thing you wanted to do was touch one of those. And Paul begins there, you see. The cross is meant to offend the wise. It's meant to be a stumbling block. Because everything about it is the antithesis of what culture deems to be valuable. Yeah. And the pastor who called me yesterday said, I think America loves a superhero, not a bleeding savior. Yeah. And if God, if we allowed God to define greatness, we would find in that definition what the world actually needs. When lowliness is greatness, when a cruciform life is greatness, you are much slower to engage in arguments that you know have been waged since the inception of mankind and to think that you're gonna fix it is quite prideful. It's much more powerful to wash feet. It's much more powerful to take in the orphan. It's much more powerful to turn the cheek it's much more powerful when you're the king of heaven to let them strip you and flog you and put a crown of thorns that symbolizes the curse on your head. That is greatness. And the church needs to discover that the beginning of Paul's message here is Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. The cross is not the end, it's not the period on the end of a sentence. Christ crucified is the beginning, the means, the end, and Jesus, the scripture says, was crucified before the foundation of the world. It's always been in the heart of God. So step one, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Say thank you, Jesus. And that he was buried. Step two, he was buried. You say, oh, that's kind of a side issue. No, because you're going to be buried one day. Not a side issue. Unless you want to stay in that hole and decay. You know, the body actually means something to the Lord. Your body matters. I don't know why we've relinquished God's desire for us to be redeemed, sanctified, and then glorified in him. It's called the resurrection. That's what Paul talks about. The purity of your body is connected to your spiritual life. God cares about redeeming your body. Do you remember Jesus weeping at Lazarus' tomb? How many of you remember that? Raise your hand. Okay, do you also remember him weeping at the casket of the widow of Nain? I think he's weeping for two reasons there. One, he's weeping because he's grieving along with those who lost a loved one. It's so important when you walk through suffering, and let's be real, life, I should say it another way, suffering is promised in life by Jesus. It's not a matter of whether or not you'll suffer. Peter actually writes, we will suffer. It's a, it's a promise that we will suffer for the sake of godliness. If we want to live a godly life, we will suffer. I'm not saying God is the origin of sickness. Don't, 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 please don't say what I'm not saying. But how many of you have discovered, the older you get, that life's not easy? When we, before we started the school, Pastor Paul Teske, who's been in the ministry for 50 years. I was a, just a traveling evangelist at the time, and he's been on my board now for 15 years. Yeah. He was a chaplain on a nuclear warship and a chaplain in the Navy for a very high-ranking officer in the Navy, seven years in seminary. 
Seven years, wow, that's a long time. This is my third year and I can't wait to be, del well, if you're watching, we love you. <laughs> we love Regent, I'm enjoying it, but I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready to get my paper done. He looked me in the eye, he pastored in Connecticut for years, I think 28 years there before that, Texas, Ohio, Panama, and in between, you know, on these naval carriers, solid, solid man. And he said to me, are you sure you wanna start a school? I go, yeah, how hard could that be? <laughs> he goes, hold on, I, I feel like I just need to say this. Are you sure you wanna start a school? I said, yeah, Rev, I'm sure, Rev. He goes, uh, okay, the school starts, and I called him, I said, Rev, I think we started gathering on those Sunday nights, a little group, well, it was, uh, we were shocked that 400 people came the first night, and y'all have continued to come now. That's been five years since the Sunday night. But remember, we didn't call it a church, really, until this is our third, look, wow, this is our third anniversary for Sunday mornings. Let's give the Lord praise. This is beautiful. So, when Rev kind of saw what was happening with the local church community being birthed, he goes, ah, hold on, we gotta talk. I said, what do you wanna talk about? He, I, he said, uh, you sure you want a pastor? I go, yeah, how hard could that be? <laughs> he goes, well, if they keep coming, there's just something I wanna tell you. He said, take all your problems now, and then multiply those problems by the amount of people that are attending your meetings. That will now be your responsibility. Welcome to shepherding. I go, ah, I disagree. If we lead them into the presence of God and teach the scriptures, everyone's gonna be so nice and <laughs> Christian and Jesus-like. Nobody would ever divide. Nobody would ever betray. Nobody would gossip. Nobody would go on social media rather than talk it out. I mean, I've taught them Matthew 18 since the very beginning. Nobody would break the scriptures. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and what can you expect when you sin as a pastor and the Lord goes, hmm, and he throws a verse into your spirit, go repent if I'm snippy with Jess. Why, why would the Lord protect me from snippy sheep, if Jess and I get snippy with each other, <laughs> it wasn't like the most divine revelation, but it's a reality, life is hard. Life is hard in the ministry. Life is hard in family. As I've said before, in Ephesians 5, Paul connects marriage to the husband dying. That's the only way to survive that thing. You're like, oh no, don't you lie. It's God's design. It actually says, submit ye to one another. Next verse, wives submit to your husbands. Now he defines that. Wives submit to your husbands, right? And then he tells the husband, husbands love your wives. And then he defines it by dying for her as Christ died for the church. Ah, death is... Let me say it another way. Marriage is martyrdom. <laughs> it actually is. In fact, in the early church, at every marriage ceremony, and they still do it today in the Eastern Church, you will find in the liturgy a moment where they begin singing a song that honors the martyrs. I'm going somewhere here. I'm not doing a stand-up act. This is actually... <laughs> a biblical perspective. Marriage is holy martyrdom. Not necessarily physically, but the only way to have a godly marriage is to die to self daily. Now who has defined that? Listen carefully. Who has defined that? The Lord Jesus through the cross. The cross must be the origin of all your theological perspective. And in the Christian life, the cross must be the basis and the epicenter in all we do, marriage included. We all say, I am about justice. I want justice in my marriage. That's cool, but on this side of the cross, forgiveness is justice. It doesn't mean there doesn't need to be confession, repentance, restitution, 
All that matters. All that matters. When you break the heart of your spouse, if you're unfaithful, don't devalue them by thinking that your I'm sorry is enough to get them to trust you again. I'm not saying that. There's a biblical pathway. However, however, the Christian life is a life of forgiveness between family members, church members, staffs, teams, worship teams, you name it. We are constantly forgiving for a reason because of the cross. We are cross carriers. Say amen. Now here, here, Paul mentions the burial. This is very important. Very important. Everyone in this room, should Jesus tarry, will breathe your last. I want you to ponder it. We spend our whole life trying not to die. I believe in taking care of yourself. I believe in living a holy life physically. If you've ever had to give someone or walk somebody through a cancer diagnosis, you, you instantly discover their soul now is being affected. Their heart for God is, is at war. They're wanting hope, and they are at war even in moments where they were not at war before. The thought that the spirit and soul are not intricately connected to the body is completely unchristian. God has a desire to raise our bodies from the dead. It's a big deal to him. The resurrection is a big deal. And one day you'll breathe your last. And this is my challenge to you. Everything you're fighting for now, glorying in, arguing about, running on that hamster wheel for, 99% of it won't matter. What if we live today for the only thing that will matter when we breathe our last? Jesus was buried. I want to read to you just a few early church prayers regarding the burial of Jesus. This is one of the writers writing on behalf of Hades. Remember when Jesus died, he descended into the lower parts of the earth, the scripture says in 1 Peter, but it's throughout the scripture. Here he writes, Hades crying out, would that I had not received this one who was born of Mary. For he has come upon me and loosed my power. You need to give the Lord praise. He has shattered the ancient gates of brass. That's Psalm 24. Oh, that's why we open with that today. Open up ye everlasting doors. That's why it's in the song that we wrote, Christ is Overcome. When we wrote that, we were talking about the gates of Hades being lifted up, these ancient gates, because the king draws near. The souls which I have held as of old, speaking of those in the underworld, as God, he has raised them up. Glory, O Lord, to your cross and to your resurrection. Amen. Listen to this. Speaking of the underworld again. My authority is dissolved. <laughs> this is so powerful. I received a mortal as one of mortals, but this one with a capital O. Over him I am powerless to contain. With him I lose all those who have been bound up. In other words, he's not leaving the underworld alone. He's leaving with friends, taking captivity captive. Does Matthew's gospel not say that when Jesus was raised from the dead, that those in their tombs were raised with him? How'd you like to get a knock on your door from your mom's great uncle asking for hummus and falafel because he'd just left the tomb? <laughs> Jerusalem was a wild place when Jesus came out of the grave. This is the gospel. And when we don't give our hearts to the gospel, we begin to fear death more than we ever should. And I want you to notice at the beginning of chapter 15 that Paul connects our standing to the reception of the gospel. If your life is in and out, you need the weight of the gospel. Listen to this. 
I am powerless to contain him, Jesus. With him I lose all those over which I had ruled. For ages I have held the dead. But behold, he has raised them up. Glory, O Lord, to thy cross and your resurrection. Today, Hades cried out, groaning, my power has been trampled on. Oh, this is powerful. The shepherd has been crucified, and Adam, he is raised up. You know, in this depiction behind us, this is how the early church would have furthered much of the gospel, because they could not read. And this is an ancient depiction called the Anastasis, the resurrection. And you see here the Lord Jesus pulling Adam and Eve out of the underworld. Under them, you see the bones beneath them. And then to the left, to the left you see Solomon and King David because they prophesied of him. The entire temple, Solomon's temple, was about Jesus. David's writings in the Psalms, hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Psalms, all about Jesus now they're watching on. To the right there, on the right side, you see a shepherd. That's Abel. It's Abel. Jesus is the great shepherd. Abel was a type and shadow of Jesus who was an under-shepherd who chose blood rather than veggies. Let me, let me stay focused. You have many of the, of the minor and major prophets behind him. The point is this. He goes down to rescue his old friend that betrayed him and redeem the entire race of humanity. That's God's desire, God's plan. This one really, yeah, you can give the Lord praise. So there Jesus is lying at the tomb, buried. And I want you to hear this last prayer. Listen. And God blessed the seventh day. Say the Sabbath. Sabbath. Now here Jesus embodies the Sabbath in the tomb. And he's lying there. Truly resting from all of his works. It is the day of rest in which the only begotten Son of God rested from all of his works. And through this death, in body he rested. And having returned to it again through the resurrection, he has granted us life eternal as the only good and merciful Lord. I want you to notice here that the seventh day is the day in which Jesus lay in the tomb. Also want you to notice, I don't have time to go there this morning, how many of you know the day, Jesus School students, you cannot answer. All right. On which day did the seed break the ground in the creation account? The third day. The third day. It was on that day that the seed, what is Jesus called in Genesis chapter 3? The serpent crushing seed. The entire creation account speaks of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And what does Jesus say in John chapter 12? to the Greeks who come to him, wanting to talk to him? What does he say through his disciples to tell them? Unless a kernel of grain go into the ground and what? Die. Say die. die. It abideth alone. But if it goes into the ground and dies, it beareth much fruit. He's talking about himself. Today I sit in front of a crowd of people who are the fruit of Jesus' death because he went into the ground. Say death, death. Burial, burial, resurrection. resurrection. Let, me keep, let me keep reading here. And that he rose again. Say thank you, Lord. The third day according to the scriptures. Say, Jesus is, Jesus is alive. Let me just talk to you about just a few things that we experience because of the resurrection. Get ready to write. Then I'm going to pray for you, and then we'll receive Holy Communion. Number one, 
the resurrection of Jesus declares that he is the Son of God. Say amen. That is Romans chapter 1 verse 4. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness. In other words, according to the Holy Spirit. By his resurrection of the dead, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And today he lives in you. Can I say that again? The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And right now, if you are a born again believer, he lives inside of you. Amazing. So number one, he is declared to be son of God. Acts 2, 24, verse 24. Oh, I love this one. Carla, I give you permission to get so excited when I read this verse that you hit Ryan. All right. Acts 2, 24. God raised him up. Oh, I love that no man laid hands on Jesus to get him out of the grave. You see, he's different than the others who were raised from the dead. He's different than the little, than the little boy who Elijah raised from the dead. He's different than Lazarus. He's different than the widow of Nain's son. He's, because they all needed somebody. They all needed a man to get involved. Jesus did not. Because he is fully man and fully God. He sat up all alone as the second person of the Godhead, along with the Holy Spirit, by the will of the Father. No man raised Jesus from the dead. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, go find his body. I mean, we know where, gosh, we know where movie stars' bodies are. We know where, I mean, Jesus is the most famous person to ever touch the earth. I mean, the date bears homage to his name. Don't you think? And, 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 well, maybe they stole his body. You ever try stealing a dead body? Where do you go with it? It's not like you can put it in your pocket and get past a garrison of troops. I love this. God raised him up. Say, God raised him up. Raised him. Loosing the pangs of death. Listen to the next statement. Because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It's not that the... What that's saying is no matter how hard every prince and power, the earth itself, attempted to keep Jesus in that tomb, it was impossible for him to stay in. Why? Because of his holiness. Because of his perfection. What did the Lord say to Adam and Eve? In the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And that started with a spiritual death. They lived hundreds of years after that. But they were dying as they lived. In other words, sin equals death. Sin equals corruption. The scripture says, from dust you've come, to dust you will return. Everyone stayed in the grave because of sin. Here Jesus gets up declaring, the grave cannot hold me because I am sinless. You need to be excited about that. It was not possible that the grave hold him because he's too pure. You cannot hold the one who's holding you. You missed that. You cannot hold the eternal Sabbath as he's resting from all of his works, the one who spoke creation into existence. He is creator. All things were made through him. And without him, John writes, nothing, 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 nothing was made that was made. How could the earth hold the one who holds the earth? And that's what pride does. Pride will bring you into a fight that you are not fit to win. The devil should have never, ever inspired Judas to do such a thing. It was to his demise. The Sanhedrin should have never done that. It was to their demise. Satan himself should have stayed out of it. Do you know why he couldn't see it? Because he's blinded to the humble. 
Jesus went too low. Psalm 22, I am but a worm. Philippians chapter two, that because of the cross, right? Because he, it's not counted a robbery to him be, for him to be considered God. And because he died a death, even the death of the cross, he's been given the name above every name. Lowliness protects you from the pride of the devil. Hallelujah. Secondly, the resurrection assures us of our justification. Justification is simply this. The removal of our guiltiness, it doesn't stop there, and the addition of our righteousness that's been declared. It's one thing to say not guilty. It's entirely another thing to say not guilty and you are innocent and righteous. Do you realize that you stand before the Lord today justified by the Lord Jesus himself? Do you realize that the Lord looks through a red hue of blood when he looks at you? He has to look through the lens of the blood of his son when it comes to dealing with you. How precious is the Lord. I said how precious is the Lord. Because of the resurrection, Jesus is interceding. And the Bible writes that he ever lives to intercede for us in Hebrews 7, 25. The resurrection proves him to be God. The resurrection is our justification. The resurrection has given us the beautiful opportunity to have an intercessor at the right hand of the Father. And his resurrection, lastly, is my resurrection. His resurrection, help me there, Joel is my resurrection. When I, when Jess and I first got married, we were living in Dallas. I had an uncle named Bob who was dying. I've shared this publicly at events. He, he attended the Catholic Church. He was not a, faithful, you know, parishioner. He, would, he was a holiday attendee. Not, I, no, there's none, none of those here today at all. But he made his appearance. You know, he tipped the Lord with his amazing arrival into a church. It's quite funny, huh? Lord, I'm here. You think the Lord's like, oh, good, good. <laughs> I didn't know the church was built on you, Michael. I thought it was built on, on me. He was one of those. And he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. He'd smoked all his life. He was my uncle. We loved him. And Jesse and I were a few months in on marriage. My mom and dad had been visiting uh, him at the hospital there in Tampa daily. And every time they tried to pray for him, he'd say, nope, I don't want to be prayed for. I don't want Jesus, I was born a Catholic, I am dying a Catholic. So sad, huh? He let religion and his perspective get in the way of people simply praying for him. Well, the doctor came in and said, he's got a couple days to live. And my mom called me. And I'm just going to ask as I give this altar call that we remain still, please. So my mom calls and says, pray for your uncle. And I, I didn't feel like I had time to fly to Tampa. So I wrote him a letter with my own handwriting. I spelled out the gospel as clearly as I could. I think it was like five pages of, in my own handwriting. I talked to him about the Lord's love for him. You know, the origin of the gospel is not our sin. The origin of the gospel is God's love. Our sin is a real thing. It should be addressed. But the Lord died for us because he loves us. And I talked to him about the love of God. I talked to him about the incarnation. I talked to him about the life of Jesus, his teachings. I talked to him about this death 
burial and resurrection. And I talked to him about his own life. Your family knows you. And in this letter, I began to, after spelling out the gospel as clearly as I could, I began to beg him to come to Jesus. I FedExed overnight these five pages to the hospital, or to my mom, I think maybe the hospital. They brought it to his room. His wife, my aunt, opened the package. She was so thankful. She was much more soft in the heart. And she said, Bob, this was his wife speaking now. She said, Michael wrote a letter to us. Can I read it to you? He said, get that thing away from me. And he knows he's dying. See, the thing about sin is we think that the greater we suffer, that ultimately we will fear the Lord eventually. That's not how it works. In fact, some of the most offended people are people who've grown in offense even as they suffer. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that people have boils on their skin and they will look to heaven and curse God. You would think that if you had boils on your skin, you'd repent. But the issue is regarding human nature, sin metastasizes. Sin grows, sin spreads, it is contagious. So he said, get, get those papers away from me. And then my mom begged him, Bob, please give your heart to Jesus. You don't have much time. Please. Just hear the gospel. Hear that Jesus died for you. Hear that he bled for you. Hear that he's alive. And that he wants to give you a new life. He said, Evelyn, get away from me. My dad tried. For days, he was resisting the love of Jesus. Finally, my brother walked in and went to share the gospel with him. And when my brother tried to share the gospel with him, my uncle rejected him and said, get out of my room. Amazing, huh? He was a really nice guy. But this offense had grown in his heart against the Lord. My brother left the room in shame and was walking down the hallway of the hospital. And while he's walking down the hallway, he hears the Holy Spirit. He's so gracious. I said, the Holy Spirit is so gracious, so loving, so kind. He said, are you going to give up that easily? Sometimes we need God's perspective. I mean, my whole family for weeks, right? for years, we wanted him to receive Jesus. I write him a letter. My brother goes in, my mom goes in. He rejects them all and the Lord says, you're gonna give up so easily? In my book, that's not giving up easily. That's being incredibly long suffering. But the Bible says that God wills that none perish, but that all receive eternal life. That's his heart. We felt rejected. The Holy Spirit thought of it as giving up so easily. Remember that the next time you share Jesus with somebody. In fact, when you're rejected, it's a great honor. It's a great privilege to be rejected. So my brother turned around and walked back in the hospital room. He said, Uncle Bob, I'm not giving up this easily. He said, you need to receive Jesus. To my shock, my Uncle Bob looked at him again and said, get out of my room. And so he did. In a very short time, my parents remained in the room with my uncle and death began to set in. And if you've ever been around it, it's clear as day. That death rattle set in. He was working to breathe. And I think about 10 minutes prior to him breathing his last, he started to fight off like these invisible beings. Here was this weak man for days, now using every ounce of his strength to get away from these demons. The, the nurse had witnessed hundreds of deaths and she said to my mom and dad, she said, he doesn't know Jesus, does he? 
And my parents said, no. And, and my, my mom and dad said, well, h- how do you know? How, why would you ask that? She said, oh, I've witnessed hundreds of deaths. I think it was like over 600 or something. I've witnessed hundreds. I can tell you all the ones who know Jesus. This is a nurse. She said, I can tell you all the ones who know Jesus, and I can tell you the ones who don't. The Bible says, blessed, blessed is the death, or holy, filled with presence, in other words, is the death of your saints. So my uncle began to, in front of the hospital staff and in front of my family, fight off the devils of hell. I don't say that with joy in my heart. It's a family member. But my job is is to give you the reality of the gospel. I'm willing to do it at my own expense. Immediately, the nurse looked at my mom and dad and she said, do you guys know the Lord? They said, absolutely. And she said, well, what I've learned is let's just worship Jesus. I've learned that as we begin to worship, at least the torment will stop. And so right there around his bed, they began to sing worship songs. And sure enough, the torment stopped. Bob, to my knowledge, unless it happened in that final second, never surrendered his heart to Jesus. And there is a moment, friends, where it will be too late. It's not just in the New Testament. It's throughout the Old Noah's ark's door closed. And the ark door of this age will close. Either when you close your eyes or when Jesus returns. And tomorrow isn't promised to anyone under the sound of my voice. Nobody. The Bible says God knows when a single sparrow falls to the ground. He knows when we lose one of our hairs. They're all numbered And you know when you finally realize that the Lord holds your breath? When you're fighting to get your own. It's in that moment where we are truly left powerless and we discover that he is resurrection and life or not. You think you're holding the breath in your lungs today. You're not. God is holding it in his mercy. With every head bowed and eye closed, he brought you here today. Not because he hates you, but because he loves you. And he suffered, he died, he bled, he was buried, and he's alive today. And he longs to be your resurrection so that you too on that day can face death with the guarantee and the hope of the eternal life that Jesus has purchased. With every head bowed and eye closed, you say, Michael, I feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I'm being pulled in my heart as you're talking. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want my sin washed away. I don't want to live the life I'm living anymore. I don't want to face a righteous judge in my own strength and merit. I want the blood of Jesus to be my testimony. I want to stand before the Lord in the righteousness of his son. Maybe there are others of you who once walked with Jesus and you're not anymore. You've grown cold. The Bible says that he will spew us from his mouth if we are lukewarm. Our loving bridegroom who died for a prostitute bride only knows one version of love. It's an all-in burning love. If you're one of those two groups with every head bowed and eye closed, you say, I, I want what you're talking about. I want you to lift your hand right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want us all to stand. I want us all to stand. You can put those hands down. I want you to, once you stand, just close your eyes and meditate on the Lord. If you raised your hand or you wish you did, in just a second, I'm going to open the altars. If you brought someone who needs the Lord, I want to give you full permission. And unless you're on the usher team, nobody moving. I know in other churches, you get up during the altar call. This is not our church. This is the holiest moment of the meeting. If you brought someone that you know needs the Lord Jesus, this is serious business. I want you to have the boldness and the loving humility to look them in the eye right now. Who cares if it makes them uncomfortable? I promise you, 
when they leave this altar, they'll be glad you discomforted them. I want you to look them in the eye right now and say, come on, do you wanna give your life to Jesus? If you raised your hand or you wish you did, I want you to get down here now. The altars are open, come, come. Many of you raised your hands. The balconies, down here on the floor. Or if you didn't raise your hand, if you wish you raised your hand, get down here. And children, yes, thank the Lord. Children, <laughs> children, if you, if you can understand what I'm saying, if you can understand what I'm saying, kids, I want you to look your parents in the eye and say, Mom and Dad, I want to give my life to Jesus. You come, come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Sometimes we actually need to shake the religious chains and bondage off of what an Easter service can actually bring. Parents, grandparents, look those kids in the eye that you know are not living holy lives and say, come on, let's go. Time to get washed by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. How precious. Come, young and old, they're coming. Thank you, Lord. They're coming from the balcony. Give you all the praise. We'll wait, we'll wait. Husbands and wives, do not be afraid to look one another in the eye right now. You want a godly marriage? Get that spouse born again. <laughs> you want a hellish marriage? Keep them in chains. Thank you, Lord. Look, they're still coming. We give you all the glory. They're still coming. All the glory. Court, Court and Emma, come please. There might be some Jesus School students here who brought their parents for Easter service. Look your parents in the eye. Say, Mom and Dad, come on. Come on. Get ready to meet the Lord. Look, they're still coming. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, ma'am. Come. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Isn't this wonderful? I said, isn't this wonderful? Come on, let's give Jesus praise one more time. Thank you, Father. I want us all to remain standing, and those of you who've come forward, I'm seeing students and volunteers here with family members holding them. What a blessed time. I want us to declare this with boldness. All the shame leaves, yeah. God bless you, you come. God bless you. All the condemnation goes. They're still coming up the side. We'll wait, we'll wait. This is why we're here. God bless you, Chanel. I'm proud of you. Don't fight that conviction, guys. I've said many times there was a day where I'd hurry past I didn't want to be the guy who would beg people to come to Jesus I'm that guy I'll beg you unapologetically to come to Jesus so as, I, as we begin praying you'll not interrupt us if you feel like you need to get through the crowd break through the crowd like the woman with the issue of blood and let Jesus heal you let's declare this out loud I want the entire church all of you watching around the world in your homes pray this with us maybe you're there watching and your children are there with you. One of you need to give your life to the Lord. Get down on your knees right there in that living room, in your dorm room. Maybe you're there in a hospital watching. I don't know. Give your life to Jesus today. Let's all pray this out loud. Heavenly Father, you are holy. You are righteous. You are pure. And I've sinned against you. And I ask you, Father, to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. I confess my sin today. Wash me in the precious blood of Jesus. Jesus, I repent. I turn from this world. I turn from my sin. And I turn from the devil himself. And I renounce him. And I turn completely to you, Lord Jesus, as my only hope for salvation. I declare and I believe that you are the Holy Son of God, 
that you're born of a virgin, lived a perfect and pure life, that you suffered and died, you were buried and raised from the dead. Today you are seated at the right hand of the Father. And you are coming back again to judge the living and the dead. Find me ready, Lord Jesus. Save my soul. Let my heart burn with holy fire. I want to love you. And I want to know you. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise, please? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, those of you who came forward, you should all have a pamphlet. Please don't waste it. Prayer has gone into it. Study. You name it. This has been very intentional. It's so beautiful. In that pamphlet, you're going to discover disciplines that are needed to live a victorious Christian life. Number one, read your Bible every day. Your Bible is true bread. The voice of God is our food. It keeps us alive. Number two, pray every day. It's all in the pamphlet. Number three, get baptized in water. We'd love to do that here. If you're not from the area, find a church and tell them you want to be baptized in water. Number four, do not live the Christian life alone. It makes no sense. You can't even really take communion properly or see it properly without an understanding of the body of Christ. Find people who love Jesus more than you and open your heart to people in his presence. That's called church. Huh? Number five, you need to tell someone what happened to you today. Tell them. Bear witness of it. You can, I want to encourage you to do it before you even leave the property. Text somebody. Call someone before you drive off. Do it outside or in the lobby. Tell them what happened to you. It's very holy, very precious. Give the Lord the glory for what he's done in your life. Number six, number six. And last but not least, we're going to pray that the power of the Holy Spirit come upon you. Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. This power is for service. Other people in your life need what you have now. You carry Jesus now. You say, I don't feel like I do. You do. You carry Jesus now, but you can't do it in your own power. You need his power. You say, well, how, how do I receive the power of the Holy Spirit? By receiving, not in your own merit, not by screaming, nothing. No, it's because of the blood. It's because of the blood. So church, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stretch our hands towards them. And prayer teams, I want you laying hands on them. And I want us to pray touching one thing. Yeah, hit those strings. And I want us to begin believing the Lord now to touch them and fill them with the Holy Spirit. So church, begin to pray out loud. Go ahead. Father in heaven, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. And we ask you to send forth the power of the Holy Ghost upon these people. Clothe them in your glory. Clothe them in your power. May the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit be released upon them so that they might be a witness save their parents, save their siblings, save their children, save their grandchildren, save their friends, move in their schools, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. Keep praying for about another 20 seconds, out loud, church, out loud. You came forward, you just received. Lord, we thank you for the blessed presence of the Holy Spirit. Great baptizer, fill them, I pray. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord all the glory? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you came forward, yeah, give the Lord all the glory. If you came forward, you stay here. I, I want you all to split right down the center aisle. Go to the sides. If you're here, just stay up front. Ushers, come forth with the communion. These precious people who came forward to receive Jesus, they're going to receive communion first. They'll be the first ones in line. So ushers, come forward. Let's remain standing as the ushers bring the communion. Yes, these people here on this side, if you could just move that way. 
They're going to bring the communion right there. Rather than you go back to your seat, I just think it would be beautiful if you received first. Thank you, Lord. How many of you are thankful for the body and blood of Jesus? Look at these families hugging. So beautiful. Thank you, Lord. Wow. All right. Now for this blessed moment. The Bible teaches that we should examine ourselves. So, Father, we come. We ask you, Lord, to shine the light of the Holy Spirit. Your word says that you alone know the hearts of men. So cleanse us afresh, Lord, as we repent of our sin, all of us. We ask you to forgive us. Forgive our motives. Forgive our works. Forgive our, uh, all we do and say, Lord, if it grieves you. Wash us. And we release everyone, Lord. We forgive today. I want all of you right now just to take a moment and issue forgiveness to people who've hurt you. And now let's just pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, Holy Lord, take these elements, these gifts, these mysteries, and let the presence of the Holy Spirit come upon this moment. As we prepare to receive your body and blood, heal your people as they approach the table of the Lord. Let every sickness die as they receive this meal that unlocks the power of the covenant. And may the stripes of Jesus heal everyone's mind, everyone's body, everyone's heart. Lord, you mend and heal the brokenhearted and you bind up our wounds. Fill us with life as we receive your body and blood. You said, this is my body that is broken for you. Eat it, eat it, receive it. This is my blood that is shed for you for the remission of sins. Drink it. And so thank you, Jesus, for your precious body and blood. Amen, amen. If you've never been to Jesus' image before, the way we receive communion is you will come forward, you'll be dismissed by rows, you'll go back to your seat with the element, you'll take it as a family or with your friends, whoever you brought. Please don't receive it alone. If you, if you are alone, ask someone if you can receive it. If you see somebody who's alone, please invite them. You may be seated and our ushers will dismiss you. Once you receive, you're dismissed to go and we will see you tonight. God bless you all. As you come forward, if you're sick, believe the Lord to heal you.
We believe that the nations will descend on this land. That the sick will be healed here. That the lost will be saved here. That the presence of the glory of God will rest here. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains might shake at your presence. That the gospel will go forth from here. Shaking the earth for the glory of God. That the presence of Jesus Christ would dwell among us. Here we will enter into the peace of your presence. Here we will remain. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. Here we will remain. This is holy ground. Where only one thing is needed, Jesus. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped here. May his word be taught in clarity and love here as we tell the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works he has done. May the generations come to find him here. To find Jesus here. Here. Together we will build the house of God. And a home for his people. <laughs>